imagine the following game. You tilt a table by raising its legs on one side, then you draw some periodic path on the table, and I must come up with an object that will roll down exactly following this path. We call this object a trajectoid, and this game seems pretty hopeless. Sure, if you draw a straight line, then a cylinder would do the job, or if you draw a line at an angle, I can still win by changing the initial orientation of my cylinder. If you draw periodic arcs, I can try something conical, but it will get stuck after passing a single period. But for all other paths, I will lose the game, right? Well, let's not give up just yet. For instance, there are two known special cases of shapes that roll in swaying, meandering paths. Spherocons and oloids. By generalizing on these two shapes, I devised an algorithm for winning this game whenever it is possible to win. Turns out it is possible in infinite number of cases, but more importantly, the set of these cases is rich enough to be impressive. Here are some examples shown in top view. The inclination of the table is to the right. You might think that the particle here is remotely controlled, but in fact it is moving completely on its own. Now let's talk about the rules of the game compatible with this algorithm. First the physics. Center of mass is fixed where I want it. In practice I achieve it by inserting a heavy ball bearing into a precise location of a 3D printed shape. Slope of the table must be small and we neglect all inertial effects. Rolling happens without slipping. Lastly, I can choose the initial orientation as I please. The input paths that you may give me must satisfy the following conditions. First, you should demand that my particle rolls downhill sustainably along your path, and therefore your path is periodic. It consists of identical repeating segments. Without this rule, the game is too boring, since I can always make my particle gigantic, and by the time it will finish the path, it has barely rotated at all. It's just much more interesting to investigate the possibility of infinitely sustainable rolling, such as the one we see in spherocons and oloids. But this means that after completing certain number of periods of the path, the trajectoid must arrive at precisely the same three-dimensional orientation as it had at the start. We then call it one period trajectoid or two period trajectoids and so on uh, by the number of periods that it travels per revolution. This condition can be split into two subconditions. First, there must exist a sphere such that when it is rolled along the single period of the path, the contact point must trace a closed curve on the sphere surface. Here it means that the label of the tennis ball must end up facing the camera. Second subcondition is that the orientation with respect to the vertical axis must be the same at the start and at the end of such roll. Now I'm rolling the tennis ball such that the first condition is fulfilled and the label is facing the camera, but the orientation of the label is different, which violates the second condition. By gauss bonnet theorem, the second subcondition is equivalent to having equal areas on both sides of the closed curve traced by the contact point on a sphere rolling along the path. Here these areas are shaded green and yellowish. For a trajectory to exist, each area must be 2 pi r square, exactly half of the area of the sphere. So only by tuning the size of the sphere, I must make the spherical trace closed and on top of that, make it split the area of the sphere exactly in half. It turns out that the difficulty of doing so sharply depends on the number of periods traveled by the trajectory per each revolution. Let's try to make a one-period trajectory first. As I'm tuning the size of the sphere, the black ends of the one-period trace are unlikely to meet, so the trace is unlikely to become closed. And even if the two ends meet by chance, the areas are unlikely to be equal on both sides of the trace. In fact, since it's all about the relative sizes of the sphere and the flat path, for convenience we usually fix the size of the sphere, but tune the size of the path instead. This way it's easier to see how the trace on the sphere changes with scale. If it's impossible to satisfy these conditions for the path you gave me, I can try to cheat by modifying your path, for example by appending a sort of bridge that provides both the closure of the trace and the equality of the areas. We even made an algorithm that finds such a bridge for an arbitrary path automatically. As an alternative way of cheating, I can somehow deform your path until the needed conditions are fulfilled. Overall, while there are infinitely many paths for which a one-period trajectory exists, stumbling upon one of them at random is unlikely. In stark contrast, no cheating is needed when I try to make a two-period trajectory because for two-period trajectoid, the closure of the trace and the equality of areas become surprisingly easy to satisfy for almost any path you give me. These two tricky requirements are reduced to one, which is infinitely more likely to be satisfied.
we only need to find a sphere on which exactly quarter of the area is enclosed by the green trace of single period and the red geodesic arc connecting the ends of the trace. And that's it. If we can make it, then a two-period trajectoid exists. It's easy to prove, and you can find this proof in our article. Okay, but once I'm sure that the trajectoid exists for your path, how do I actually find the shape of this trajectoid? To understand the basic idea behind the shape construction algorithm, let's take a sphere and cover it in a layer of Play-Doh. If we push it against a flat surface, there will be a dent in the Play-Doh. In my computer algorithm, the virtual table just eats the virtual Play-Doh that touches the table. If we forcibly roll the sphere along the desired path, there will be a sort of groove in the Play-Doh layer, and if we let it roll on its own, it will now follow the groove and magically follow the target path. Well, it's the same magic that defines the path of an ordinary cylinder. The center of mass maintains its height during rolling along the target path. Height is equal to the radius of the inner hard sphere. But to deviate from the path, the center of mass must be lifted, as I'm showing here for a cylinder. Lifting the center of mass requires energy, so objects prefer not to deviate from the path. For a perfectly linear path, the result of this algorithm looks like this when the Play-Doh layer is very thin. Sections that never touch the floor are shown in yellow. If we choose a thicker layer of Play-Doh, the result looks like this. And if even thicker, it looks like this. And so on. Basically, the result rolls like a cylinder as expected. For a more complex path, using a thin layer of Play-Doh results in an object with easily recognizable groove. Using a thicker layer of Play-Doh produces a more stable but less recognizable shape. Yet the principle remains the same. In real life, it works, but imperfectly. For instance, in sharp turns the particle tends to recoil and can bounce a few times before continuing downhill. This would not cause accumulation of error if not for the non-commutativity of three-dimensional rotations, which means that flipping the order of rotations changes the outcome. Because of that, rolling a sphere over a small loop does not bring you to initial orientation upon return to the starting point. So circling in small loops here produces net rotation with respect to z-axis. And you can see that the general direction of path has changed after the sharp turn. There are two more rules that are kind of soft. If you violate them, the success is not guaranteed, but failure is not guaranteed either. One rule is that your path should not have uphill excursions. Yet we found that by using inertia, it's still possible to traverse an uphill excursion. You just have to be careful not to have too much inertia or you'll roll over in a sharp turn like a top heavy car. Another rule is that there should be no self-intersections in your path or in a curve that is traced on a sphere by the contact point. We had some limited success breaking this rule. Inertia can be used to cross the intersection if the intersection angle is not too acute on the particle surface. Still, such particles fail after passing several periods because the inertia engineering is hard. I must balance the friction losses, the slope of the table, the mass of the object, and all of this makes sustainable motion challenging. To sum up, our algorithm can win this game for infinitely many trajectories where only a handful of solutions were known before. In real experiments, effects like inertia, friction, slipping, gyroscopic forces lead to failure in some cases, but are responsible for success in cases such as uphill excursions. Existence of a two-period trajectoid for almost any path is a fundamental property of three-dimensional rotations. It can be formulated like this. Almost any finite sequence of 3D rotation matrices, whose axes are coplanar, can yield the identity matrix when applied twice in a row if all rotation angles are multiplied by appropriate shared constant. As far as we know, this property remained unnoticed until now despite its relevance to diverse areas of science. For example, it may be applied to conventional block sphere representation in quantum mechanics, where the role of path is played by a pulse of external field, and the evolving quantum state is equivalent to the orientation of the rolling trajectoid. It follows from the two-period trajectoid existence that almost any planar field pulse, once scaled by an appropriate factor and applied twice in a row, will return the quantum system exactly to its original state. Scaling of pulse here means either stretching in time or tuning the amplitude. One scaling factor does this trick for all original states, because a two-period trajectoid returns to the initial three-dimensional orientation after completing two periods, not just to the same contact point. So this is a flexible way to do 360-degree rotation pulses, which may be useful in designing pulse sequences for nuclear magnetic resonance measurements.